Yeah, I mean, Adrian can come in. Yes. Stuart can join Stuart's us. Stuart's taking a dump. Adrian, right. <laughs> welcome to Jim Norton and Sam Roberts. Well, hello. How are you guys? Hi, Good. Adrian. How are you? Doing? Fancy you being here in a studio. That's what we do. Mm, Fancy you being here, huh? Well, uh, it's what I do, too. I guess so. <laughs> I guess that's right. Well, well do you well, enjoy well. it? A lot of people hate going out and doing doing press for a project. They hate it, or some people love it. You know what? I love to talk. And I got a billion stories. You can never shut me up. Really? So, really. I <laughs> I, that we just did something else and it went by in a half an hour. I thought I said one thing and it was just. <laughs> I talk and I have you always been that way, or was it when you started interacting with? Uh, with... I, I don't think I was always that way, but you know, after you have enough um, experiences, you got your stories. Like, you're like, I well, got it's like something. Any anything you mention, I can probably say something about because oral uh, sex. I don't have anything to say. About <laughs> <that>. <laughs> Nothing with Elton John. <laughs> so Elton John. <laughs> hey, what Zappa albums did you work on, or did you work with them just live? Well, I was on the uh, Sheik Your Booty album. That's one of my favorite records of all time. And I did the uh, Bob Dylan imitation that was on there, in a song called Flakes. And the way that oh, happened, right. I was hanging out at Frank's house one night, and he was showing me some music that he would be teaching the band the next week. And he was writing a song called Flakes, and when he played it for me, it sounded like mm. a really bad folk song. So I started making fun of it, and I said, started singing it. I ask as nice as I could if my job would. And he said, that's it. Yeah. That's going in the <laughs> Somehow show. Somehow be finished by Friday. Yeah, yeah. that's so great. <laughs> I, it's one of my favorite albums ever. Wow. Years later, Paul Simon actually introduced me to... Bob Dylan, who was standing in the stairwell at the club, um, at a club here in New York, he just walked over and opened the door and said, "I want to introduce you to somebody." Opens the door and there's Bob Dylan standing in the stairwell, mm. and uh, he said, "Bob, here's Adrian Blue." And Bob said, "I heard of you." <laughs> <laughs> Had he heard your impression in the song? And that's what I always wanted to know. What did he hear of me? He, he never said anymore. So I you was didn't ask left. Him? Uh, I was left with, "Well, what did you hear?" But, Why didn't uh, you ask him? I, I was starstruck. You were. Yeah. You were. Yeah, I was He's, starstruck. Plus, you never want to ask a guy, you hear the impression I did of yes. you. Yes. By the yeah. way, Bobby Brown on, off that album could be, Bobby Brown Goes Down could be my favorite song of all time. Well, I'll, I'll tell Frank that when I see him. Uh, hopefully soon. <laughs> no, no, hopefully not <laughs> soon. <laughs> not, not at all soon. <laughs> how, how well did you know him? I mean, he died. Of, he was like one of those guys that wouldn't go to a doctor, right? Frank? Yeah. They said I don't he just know. I never doctors. asked him that, but uh, I, I knew him very well because I was the one guy in the band who didn't read music, totally self-taught. So we would rehearse five days a week in a big film studio. On Friday night, I would get in his car, go home with him and spend the weekend there, and he would show me the upcoming things, a la, that's why, I just the story I just told. So for three months, I virtually lived in uh, Frank Zappa's house mm -hmm. every weekend. Wow, which I have a lot of stories to tell Ooh. about. <laughs> was he a wild liver? Was he, was he like a, a kind of a clean life, or was he? Or, or he, he was, was a he, very uh... clean living guy and the hardest working person I I can ever recall working. With. I mean, he just worked from the time he he slept late and then he worked all day and all night. Yeah, they said Prince did that too. I guess a lot of musicians are on their own schedule. You guys kind of have a you know you're not nine to five people. Hi, Stuart. Stuart no, no, Copeland. No, I, big Stu. Hey, look, gang. What, hey, what's look, going on, Stuart man? Copeland. Like this, like that. Yeah. Are we on air? We yeah, are. Yeah, we're, we're just on talking the about air. Frank Zappa <laughs> and uh, how he would sleep. <laughs> he, how he would, uh, I guess, sleep all day and then work at night. Work a lot. He was a very hard working guy. Was he one of those guys like, like again, like Prince, who would just kind of go, I, I got an idea, and then just no, get no, everybody no, no, together? No. no, not at all like that. He was very controlled. Not an idea like, here's my idea. It was sort of, here's the music, play it correctly. <laughs> oh, okay. He had a definite idea of what he wanted. Most everything was done... Uh, Deliberately. Was, yeah, and it wasn't, you know, working in Frank's band wasn't where you got to do your own thing. It was where you got to do his thing correctly and consistently. But that was okay because that's exactly what I needed at that point in my life, sort of a year's worth of tutelage. You know, I was self-taught. I never had anybody show me how to play in 7-8 until I met Frank. The next year I played with David Bowie. It was just the opposite. David just wanted me to go wild and, and would never give me any, any instructions. So there you go. Interesting. And uh, Stuart, welcome to the show. Well, can I just complete that thought? Sure. My, my favorite brag about Adrian 
This is the man stolen from Frank Zappa by David Bowie. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> that right there is a CV. Never mind Talking Heads, Graceland, all the other. T- really? Pink Crimson and everything like that. <laughs> the man who was stolen from Frank Zappa by David Bowie. I yeah. give you Adrian Balloon. I, I'm it just, is an, a, a nice little resume header. It, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, yeah, yes. Like I'm it. usually passed around like a whore at a party. You're actually stolen by one genius from another. Yeah, yeah they, <laughs> they had their way with me, Now look where ended up. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you, uh, your, your life is interesting to me, too. Like, you know, your father was, was your father one of the founding members of the CIA? So it is said. Wow. So did you grow up, like, just involved in government your whole life when you were a kid? Not at all. No. No. no um, uh, I grew up... In weird places. Uh, when I was two months old, I left Langley, Virginia, uh, when I was where I was born, um, to go to Cairo, Egypt, where my father had just installed a new dictator, Gamal Abdel Nasser, after having kicked out King Farouk. Um, and then uh, later, the family moved to Beirut, Lebanon, which is where I did most of my growing up. And I didn't get back to America till I was 18. Oh wow! But, but during none of that time were we aware of what our daddy actually did for a living? So it's really like wow. that in a CIA family. Like, yeah. nobody yeah. knows what dad does. Well, I guess my mother knew, but she... One of my father's best friends was a British agent uh, named Harry, Harry Philby, who turned out to be a double agent, and his, his we had parallel families. His kids were, were the same age as the Copeland kids, the Philby kids, and my buddy, um, uh, Philip, uh, I mean, Harry Philby, uh, was, um, he was my buddy, and one day their daddy disappeared. Uh-oh. And two weeks later, turned out he, he showed up in Moscow. He had been a double agent all this time. Wow. wow. So what did Dad say when you said, what do you do, Dad? Yeah, well, you... no, my brother Miles came home from school one day and says, Dad, are you a spy? And this is, this is a family story. Uh, and my father says, who wants to know? Mm. <laughs> but, I mean, at like 16... You got to have some like it's not like you're just, like no, a little kid. Like, you, do you follow your father's? Well, you're in Beirut. Uh, you know, you're no, in... you don't. You're in Beirut. You're a teenager, more interested in girls than what dad right. does. But for you a didn't living. understand why you were in Beirut. Like, uh, why are we living in Beirut? Right. Well, I didn't had never lived anywhere else, so it wasn't weird. So it wasn't weird at all. Yeah. Uh, but when I was in college, um, right in the height of the Allende crisis in Chile, oh, yeah. um, that's when my father had retired and he wrote his book. And on the liner notes of his book is where I discovered what my daddy did for a living. So you read that's his amazing. book and it's all, this is all news to you. Uh, yeah. You, well, my, except that, you know, later, in later years, my mother said, you could always tell who were the spies. And in Beirut, almost everybody buddy was the spies. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, you could tell the spies by how much rubbish they talked. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they could never get Harry, like Kim Philby, you could never never get him to talk seriously about anything. He would talk about the, the races, the, uh, the, the weather, the quickest way to Damascus, anything but politics. Because the minute you start talking about what you actually do, you're yeah, in trouble. That's right. Yeah. So was your dad's life in danger all this time? Like, you know, being over... Uh, the... Well, probably not. Well, actually, no. The reason we left Lebanon is because it got hot. Uh, there was uh, there was one flare up. There was only one war in Beirut while I was there in 1958, um, and in those days the United States Sixth Fleet just showed up on the horizon, and the war was over. <laughs> Uh, just, they, the, just the idea of them showing up. Well, they showed, and they did it just, just to entertain the folks of Lebanon. They did a little demonstration on the beach where they had these gigantic tanks just firing uh, a little target practice there. And those, it's pretty impressive when the Sixth Fleet shows up and the, you know, filling the horizon. Okay, everybody, let's go home. Oh yeah. They had an election. They elect actually elected an anti-American guy, but it's cool, you know. Uh, sure. Um, and those were the days when we had a lot more credibility than we do now. Ouch. Yeah, I guess it's, uh, yeah, there, were, there were times we were liked a little more. <laughs> now, now, nowadays, our, our fleet, our seventh fleet, get, you know, the way to defeat America is to go send out tankers. It's literally four accidents in a year. Isn't yeah. it a year that the, yeah. the, the Navy has had? It, what an embarrassment. They, they ceased all Navy, Navy operations for like one day, which yeah. is unheard of. Yeah. Oh, boy. Yeah. My father was kind of mysterious to me, too. What do he do? <laughs> uh, he drove a truck for a plumbing company. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, so he says. Yeah. Right, yeah. who knows? No, but what was mysterious is one day I was downtown and I saw him drive by in his truck and he was smoking a cigarette and I had no idea he smoked cigarettes. So. There you go. It's the same it's thing. Me. Double agent. There no you wonder. Go. It's the exact it, same thing. It's, it's, Adrian gets a home. mysterious life. Adrian gets home and says, Dad, do you drive a truck? And he says, 
Who wants to know? <laughs> That's yeah. right. It is yeah. weird, though, that somebody would hide. I'm amazed by people who hide smoking. Because I've known yeah. relationships where the guy smokes and the wife, don't tell my wife. How does she not know you're fucking kissing her? You're showing up. How do, yeah, how do people stink. not know you smoke? You smell like smoke? Well, I didn't know he smoked, but I, I, after all, I didn't kiss him that much. But um, We must have hugged him. Hi, I, Dad. I did hug him, and he <laughs> kind of smelled funny. Now he smelled like Dad. Then again, yeah. he worked for a plumbing company, so you know, it could yeah. be something else. He smelled True. like pipes. <laughs> oh, all right. <laughs> Maybe he smoked a pipe. I don't know. That's the best option if you work for a plumbing company. Pipes. Yeah, <laughs> is it so? You guys, are, you guys have, have have put together this like kind of. It's being called a super group. I would call it a super group. Oh, uh, we've got a new name for it. It's well, a super group. A little little background. Little background. Yeah, is yeah. This tell all me. came because of just the joy of going to Italy okay. and having a great time there. And originally, for about ten years, been going there uh, with no agenda, no product, no promo, no anything. Just to be in Italy in the summer and play these open air shows under the Italian sky. Mm -hmm. And so the agenda, if there was an agenda, was pasta. So now when people are calling us a super group, right. we correct them by saying we are in fact a supper group. Oh, oh, boy. <laughs> I like that. That's good. Um, but like, it has to be, at this point, refreshing because you guys have had all this success, so it's not like you're like Chasing after that thing that you haven't been there before. Yeah, it's just you've all about there. fun. It's just about fun and music now, right? And our and our band motto was: Look, nobody sane is ever going to hear this, right? <laughs> <laughs> but it's got to be nice though to be at points in both your careers where you've done so much stuff. Yeah, you have you you've proven yourself so many times over. Like there's no pressure. Like I got it. It's just a thing that you're just enjoying doing. That's got to be a great place to be. It's a lot of fun. That's why we are doing it because we. You know, they, they invited me over to Milan on a, on a uh, trumped up, if I can use that word. Sure. Trumped up uh, business. They said, you no, know. No, you can't use that <laughs> word. Yeah. Well, I didn't know if you were allowed to curse on, on radio or not. Now, yeah. Stu, you don't like when he makes fun of Trump. You're a Trump guy and you don't like when he mocks him. I, 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 <laughs> <laughs> no, I, do, I don't like it described as my machinations, my Machiavellian ploy being described as Trumpist were way too sophisticated for that. Oh, okay. I see. I see. Anyway, his Machiavellian ploy was to get me and Mark in the band without letting us know we were joining a band. <laughs> and so I arrived thinking I was going to play on a couple of tracks and just sit in the sun and have, you know, uh, have some pasta. And uh, next thing I knew, we were in the band because it was so good. That's my point. Well, you also, too, I mean, you write operas, so you kind of, you're doing a little bit of everything. And I want to know, how do you conceptualize an opera? Because I've never been to one. I don't know if I'd like it. Uh, it was going great, the whole opera thing, the whole, you know, composer. You know, The reason I'm writing big symphonic works and playing with the Chicago Symphony and, uh, and so on is because I'm a drummer. And the drummers, like the singers in the band, singers and drummers at opposite ends of the Jets actually have an invisible bond. We're not sure if we really are musicians. And in the middle of the jet, like the guitarist and the bass player and keyboard, they're talking in some strange language, you know, F sharp minor, G flat, you know, all this stuff. And the singer and the drummer are like, are they talking about me or are they talking about you? You know, and it's a weird language. Anyway, so that's You feel where, a little left out? I, I never would have thought that the well, drummer... Well, that's where all this, this orchestral music comes from, that basic fundamental insecurity, okay? But it was going great. I'm playing with these orchestras around the world. I'm writing big, important music, and um, it's going just great. And then this rock band came and got me this little hobby it wasn't even a well i guess it was a hobby uh in italy just going there in the summer to bang on drums which i still enjoy doing no matter how how highfalutin uh the music is i like banging on those drums and then suddenly that turned into a real thing with somebody like adrian Ballou in the band and we get mark king on board and i guess i gotta drop what i'm doing and take this seriously because it wasn't really that big a deal because it was so much fun that was an easy call so well, when oh okay. god, I was gonna. Was there any part of you that didn't want to do that? You're like ah, like I've 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 lived that that life before. I kind of just want this to be this thing that we do in Italy for us. Not an antipathy to the idea at all. I mean, I always loved the idea. That's why I would go and kind of do it and pretend to be a band every summer. Right. But then it turned into the real thing. And you're like, let's just run with this. Yeah. I just right. got out of a band, and I was not in the mood to join another band at all. Yeah. Plus, I already had another band, which I've had for 10 years, called the Power Trio. So it's a good thing that they didn't say, come on over and join a band. Right. <laughs> yeah. right. Well, you guys have also, like, being in... You, you guys have been in bands that uh, you've had to deal with some of the biggest egos in the history of, of music. So I would imagine that, that being in a band is not for either of you guys the most, uh, 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 the thing that you would jump to automatically. Is that right? 
Well, yes and no, because, uh, you know, both of us can make our own records. We can write things. Right. I, I mean, I just did a film score for Pixar. He does classical pieces, etc. cetera. Uh, we can do all that stuff by ourselves in our studios, which we have in our homes, and that's great and it's wonderful. But sometimes you really want to have that sort of uh, unseen thing happen where someone else does something that changes what you are doing that then turns into something else and that's called collaboration and it's called synergy and it's called many other things and right. you, you get that with the right group of people and it it happens so rarely that uh, when you see it as I did in Milan you say well okay I've got to do this mm-hmm. and you guys as you get older too like you've been you both been in bands you both dealt with again a lot of personalities it's like going from one marriage by, by the way can I just interject sure. I actually haven't had to deal with big egos Oh, except for mine. I'm just saying personalities. The, I'm people, not saying... I, the people I've worked with have generally, this ego thing, it's it's rarely about ego. In fact, you know, certainly the police, there was never an ego problem except for maybe me. Mm-hmm. Um, Sting didn't have any ego? No. Come I mean, on. T- totally not. <laughs> totally <laughs> not. Totally not. Ten- wow. Okay, tantric sex, we can have a laugh about that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Ego, no. Or just say That's a marriage where a bunch of ideas are, be- even if it's not yeah, an big ego ideas thing. And, yeah. and, and strong musical opinions. Oh, yeah, baby. Right. But, but what about the one name, Sting? Right there, you're like, come I on. Kinda, man. Here's why I assumed ego, <laughs> and it was an assumption. I assumed ego because I'm like, because he's so goddamn talented. Well, he's so yeah. great. Handsome. But then, and he's got the one name. A little and then bit he, too handsome. And then he takes the one name and he goes on tour with like, a loot or whatever, and he's not even doing like this, the, the well, stuff that now, everybody. Hang on just <laughs> a know, second here. Like... Well, let's put G- Gizmodrome on hold for a second here. I got some business to do. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> if he wants to make a loot album, gosh darn it, he can make a darn loot album. Yes. He's earned it. He made how many hit records? A lot. If a he lot wants to make a, a loot album, he can make a loot album. <laughs> if he wants to sing an opera, hey, look, nobody beats me up for writing opera. I guess that's yes. true. They don't expect, you know. I don't know why. Yeah. I'll tell you why. It's because the singer is typically, not always, but whenever you hear a band not being together anymore, typically the singer gets blamed. because it's it, that's He's the front man, right? Yeah, right. he's the front he's man, the man and normally the biggest yeah. flake in the band is going to be the singer. Not always, but, you know, again, they're... Well, the, he's the guy to whom everyone says... You don't need these guys. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. And the pressure, too, because the voice and By goes... the way, he stuck with us long after, you know, after, like, when we were making our third record, it was clear. This guy has a clear vision of the songs he wants to write and how to make them, and he truly doesn't need these guys, mm-hmm. but he stuck with us for two more records. Five records we got out of him. And, wow. um... I am grateful for that. I, I mean, he actually is a very loyal guy. Yeah, now, so you people, see, this is exactly how I know that I've, I've lived my entire life in an alter universe. Because I was in a band for 33 years. I was the front man, and the other guy was the guy who had all the big issues. Issues. What, uh-huh. uh, you know, what, what, uh, what did he play? He played guitar. Oh, okay, the guitarist. And Mellotron. Mellotron. And he and he was the he was the 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 uh, the issue in the band. Well, he a lot of ego. He was the band in his mind. Oh, okay. Oof. I guess that's tempting to happen when you get creative. I you know when you're collaborating creatively with other musicians. I've never done well, it. It's got to be. There's got to be you, everyone thinks that their idea is the right idea. And how do you deal with that then? Like, do you, cause you, what are you going to go up to him and be like, dude? I, yeah, how do you tell like, someone? Like, I'm the front man. What are you doing? Yeah. Well, you never could say the word dude to this person, I don't think. <laughs> um, oh, 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 yeah. I would have said dude every third word. <laughs> dude would not be the white, right Bob way Bob dude, what's it. up dude? <laughs> yeah, Mr. Dude, perhaps, but... Uh, really? Uh, really? You wouldn't have said dude. Um, <laughs> oh, how I dealt with it, I... I um, well, I dealt with it for 33 years by, first of all, having a great relationship with the person and loving him. And then I got an email one day saying, you're not in the band. <laughs> they just what? threw you out? <laughs> an email. So there you go, an email, yeah. He just threw you out? That's harsh. Threw me under the uh, couch. What was yeah, the reason for Not even for under it? the bus. They give you a reason. The couch. He just yeah. dropped a couch yeah, on just you. Dropped a couch on me. Yeah. yeah. What was the reason? Mm-hmm. Uh, I have yet to ascertain that, but I think it was probably now a mistake. Mm-hmm. I know what the reason was. Drugs? On he, his he, behalf. He wanted to make room on the stage for four drummers. Oh, <laughs> that's, that's right. Maniac. That's it. <laughs> Sorry, no room for that uh, guitar anymore. We need four <laughs> yeah. drummers. And this was yeah. done over email? 
That was done over email. 33 yes. years. 33 years. Was it a warm email, email or no? It email. Was it a warm email? Like, look, man, yeah, this is not... A, it was a terse and laconic email. No. What does laconic oh. mean? I know terse is... short. Un... Okay. Just like terse does. Okay, yeah. 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 Uh, just another cold. way of saying the same thing. Any emojis? <laughs> yeah, they were yeah, no at least like a, a frowny face no, or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nothing. No emoji. Not a single emoji. Did you wow. regret? Did you regret putting up with this nonsense for for thirty three years after that? If you're like, if this is how it was going to end, I would have told him he was an asshole in the beginning. In the yeah. beginning, yeah. 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 thirty three <laughs> years, I could have told him what an <laughs> asshole he was. Yeah. 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 Now, now, come on. I I do love this person, but I it, it just goes to show you my point. You still was, love them? Uh, we could hear it in your voice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I do. From under the couch, you love him, but Dave Navarro. I don't know why. I must be a glutton for punishment. <laughs> well, have you talked to him since? No. How long wow, has it been? That's real. That's true love. That's uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. How long has it been? I'm writing postcards. <laughs> I just don't send them. Full of emojis. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know how long ago was that. Three or four years. I don't mm -hmm. know. So you haven't mm -hmm. spoken so. in three or four years. Yeah, that's yeah. that's got to be enraging. You're doing the band for all these years, and guy cuts you out without any kind of especially the yeah, egomaniac. Okay. He's yes. putting up with him. It's He's okay. Like, no, it's a good guy. You just don't know him like I know him. You just don't. And then yeah, it's okay. In... I went off and won an Oscar, and, and you told what you won the, the Oscar for a bunch of times, and just you know joined a super. I mean a, a supper, supper group. A supper, a supper group. group. Wait, just, I'm, I'm I mean, doing okay. I'm what did worried. you win the Oscar for? A score for something? Yeah, I scored a Pixar short film last year. Cool. Uh, that does came Pixar, out. Does Pixar it, pay well. They well for a short what film. Is this, they Howard don't, Stern. They, <laughs> they don't make money on their short films. Oh. They do that because they, they they really enjoy it, and it's a way to show off their their new hardware and software and stuff and new ideas. Short story, yes, they paid well enough. But uh, the thing comes from the thing that really comes from it is when uh, you know that short film is shown in front of Finding Dory, the largest, mm -hmm. um, Ooh, most nice. successful. Um, animated film in the history of the world. It beat and Nemo. It beat Nemo, wow. which was its originator. Yeah, I had dinner one. with Andrew Stanton last night, the man who made both those movies. Oh, nice. Yeah. Quit and, bragging. Uh, and he's, uh, <laughs> he's a great guy. And um, we, you know, I, I could have never imagined that Pixar would call me to do something. So when they did, it was a great honor. They, so when you go awesome. to the Oscars, did, did, they, did they... I didn't go. Oh, you didn't go? I was on tour. Oh, power move. Couldn't you, couldn't yeah, go. I'm busy working. Yeah. Yeah, but aren't you tempted, though, if it's an Oscar? Aren't you tempted to go, like, all right, look, we got a gig, but maybe we can move the gig for that? Well, not if your gig's in Europe and you've got a. Okay. <laughs> and you've got a band, you know, and you're, you've you got to feed the guys and girls in the band. So, mm -hmm. no, no, no. It was, uh, it was okay. I didn't have to go. I went to the premiere, and that was really fun. I, I mean, had a great time doing that. I took my family and my two daughters, and. Uh, it was really great fun to see all those people and meet, you know, all the stars and, and cool. hang in Hollywood. Did but, you watch it and then just realize, you, I, like, I don't know how that works. Did you watch it and go, like, uh, as you're watching on television, realize, I won? Or did they let you know right before, like, it looks it's good? It's interesting, actually, the day before we left for tours when they had the televised part. And my bass player, Julie Slick, and I were standing in my uh, kitchen. And I said, I don't think they televised the short um, animated films, so I'm not even going to watch it. She said she was looking on her iPhone. She said, "No, I think maybe they do. In fact, I think it might be coming up now." Mm -hmm. We walked into the television room, turned on the television, and they said, "And the Oscar for best <laughs> short animated film." <laughs> wow! And it happened just right then, at that second. That cool. It, we turned the television on. We won. But wasn't that before you went on tour? If that was before you went on tour, or, it was, or a, you, it was you the just, day before we went on tour. You just, but you just couldn't make the yeah. ceremony. You just yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't. Too much stuff. Yeah, I couldn't uh, cancel a tour. Right. <laughs> yeah, but he's only got one more Oscar than me. Uh -huh. I, spent, <laughs> I, spent, <laughs> I spent twenty years scoring films with Oliver Stone, yeah. Francis Coppola, and all like that. What did you score with uh, Stone and Coppola? Uh, Wall my Street, first film, right? Uh, with uh, with Oliver Stone was uh, Wall Street and uh, talk radio. Cool. Oh wow! Okay. Wow. Uh, and uh, Francis Coppola was my first film, actually, with Rumblefish. Wow! You know I mean? Wow! Like, That's but a... all that he's you know with all that, he, this guy comes in does one film <laughs> period short film a short film and right. gets a gosh darn. Oscar for that. That's you Mickey know? Rourke and Matt Dillon, that's right? That's my Rumble Oscar. Yeah. Give me yeah. that Oscar. I've earned it. Don't worry. I started years, at the top. That's I'm, my Oscar. Started at the top and working my way to the bottom. <laughs> yeah. I'll probably yeah. never do another film. <laughs> so when you write an opera, okay. Uh, you, yeah, you're on a roll. Don't <laughs> blow it. Yeah, that's a strategy. Yeah. Do you write in English in opera or is it always in Italian? Oh, no, it's in English. 
Oh, it is. Well, why would it be in Italian? I don't know. I've never heard an opera, so I, well, I don't know. I always assume they're in... Because of Pavarotti? Because Mozart wrote in Italian. Gosh knows why, but... I don't know. I would assume an opera... He He has no idea what an opera is. No, it's so. obscure. I, I know. It's, it's already He's obscure enough. He's been very upfront about this, I think. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm being pretty pretty straightforward. I don't I don't know. I've never seen an opera. I, people say you, you'll love it or you hate it. Well, come and see mine. I yeah. would see yours, um, but do you well, sing in it? five of them. You have? Wow. Yeah. It's the most fun a composer can have with his clothes on. Really? It really <laughs> is. Because uh, in in uh, as a film composer, where I learned how to work with uh, drama and music together, and that's also where I learned how to write music for orchestra, uh, I got my orchestral training on someone else's dime, mm-hmm. um, namely Francis, Oliver, and the rest of them. Right. Uh, that's where <laughs> oh, I learned boy. how to do that. But um, the relationship with music and drama is very profound. But when you do a film score or a television score, or a game score, you're working for the man. You're not really an artist, you're a craftsman. And yeah. You serve the art of the director, and that's it's fine. The pay is great. Do they tell you to do something? Have Absolutely. you had those guys? Oh, they do. They... Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You want it happy, sad, or sad, happy? Yeah. Right. <laughs> and guess what? There is a difference. Sure. And so you learn to be very, very specific about the emotional message. You know, Tom Cruise looks into the woman's eyes and says, I love you. But the audience needs to know that he's a lying scumbag. But the sh- it's a sh- the shot is right. all moonlit. It's Are a you beauty shot. Tom Cruise the girl, the girl. Scum- <laughs> <laughs> no, the character he's playing, of course. Oh. Uh, but I mean, <laughs> and so the composer's job is to tell that message to the audience that the the woman he's saying it to or man um, doesn't know that he's lying, but the audience does. And so the film composing is very very specific emotionally. And so taking those skills into opera, the difference is that in opera it's the composer's medium. Mm. Right. And the, and the reason for that is very simple because all the great opera composers are safely dead. Right. And, and so when they put up a Mozart opera, the 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 soprano and the conductor can argue endlessly about no, well Mozart wanted this. No, I think Mozart wanted that. And so the whole dialogue is about what the composer wanted. Now if a living composer walks into the room, we can resolve this issue right now. Here is what I want. Right, yes. it's your thing. Yeah. But, so the whole thing is set up as the composer's medium. And so the pay sucks compared to film sure, composing. Sure. But the art is fantastic. It's more satisfying. But it's weird. Like, I hate to say it, but I watch a movie. The music does make me cry. It's embarrassing. Does but it? Ah, oh, fucking what gets movies, me. What, what uh, just any, any movie I've cried at, a lot of times it is jo- the music. Was, I don't do it anymore, but that was my job That's to a good make sign. you cry. Yeah, yes. but yeah. It, it, a lot of times it really is the music. Throw that violin on, and all of a you sudden see, you're sobbing. I, did, I didn't well, know any of this stuff the when I did my first film <laughs> score, and that's why I won an Oscar. <laughs> oh, we get it. Did we mention he won an <laughs> okay. Oscar? Did you, did you know? <laughs> did, did, did. Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to mention Where do you that. keep it? Where <laughs> do you the Oscar part. Where do you well, keep your thanks, Oscar? Thanks for that, Adrian. Uh, yeah. Thanks for that bit of advice. I'm surprised you didn't bring it in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Where I happen to have it with me if you guys want to see it. Where do you keep it? I'd like to. Stuart, where do you keep your Oscar? Um, oh! over, I keep my Oscar oh. over at Adrian's place. Yeah, <laughs> but I tell you what, all my Grammys are at my place. Oh! oh. In your face. Now we're talking. What I about keep the, my uh... grandmother in her place. There you go. So where do you keep your Oscar? Just on the mantle or do you not, do you not care? No, I don't have I don't have a particular place. I let it roll. You know, right now it's probably in my daughter's bedroom under the bed. Oh, boy. Oh, you, you don't have a, a honor place for it. No, I have stuff. I have stuff downstairs where it's all kind of framed and hung on the wall. And not a Grammy, though. Uh, I don't have one of those. You know what? The, the, the tradition of musicians: when you get your first gold disc, the place where it goes, the powder room, the mm. bathroom. Is that really? right? And the reason for that is very simple: because you put it on the wall in the living room, and people, you know, walk past it. They see it, or they don't even notice it, or whatever. But when it's in the bathroom. They have three minutes to contemplate your greatness. <laughs> That's a great. They, they are yeah. alone. They are alone, undistracted uh, from your greatness. I'm just getting That's a, a telephone point. call now from Germany. Oh, oh who is it? You won an Oscar. Yeah. <laughs> Mister. Won an Oscar. Hello, Sarah. <laughs> so uh, Sarah, your Sarah, your girlfriend. Or your wife? No, my wife is Fiona. Sarah is the record company in Hamburg. Oh, okay. Oh, She's our product fun. manager. Yeah. That's where the Beatles cut their teeth. That's right. That's mm-hmm. right. That's true, though. When you're in the bathroom, it gives you, like, every word of the inscription gets written mm-hmm. and, and read. That's, you know and, what I mean? And appreciate it. Yeah, yes. every, every yes. piece yeah. of Your art in the center is, of the, it, yeah. It's, it's the way of ramming it down their throat. Yeah, that's right. great. What right. a great... Especially if it's more than three minutes, depending on what you're serving for dinner. Well, the other you thing, thing the, the stage before that, you know, for a new band in England, the thing used to be that you know 
that you would have in your bathroom, you know, long before you got a Grammy or anything, you would have your Holiday Inn towel in your bathroom, mm -hmm. which is a very important message to any visitor in your home, which is, I've been to the States. Oh. I've, uh, I've toured America. Really? And so that all important Holiday Inn, the first thing an English band does when they get to America is, I don't care where we're staying, we got to stay at a Holiday Inn, and I got to get that Holiday Inn towel that I can hang in my bathroom back home. It's a I real like tradition wow. with British bands? I never knew that. Oh, the, met, the number of times I, my heart was filled with, with envy when I went to somebody's house and they had a Holiday Inn towel. That's where I keep my GED. <laughs> I don't even know what that is. Oh, yeah. General equivalency diploma. It's All what right. we get when okay. we drop out of high school. I have one and he has one. Yeah, yeah. yeah three. Right. I was, yeah, I was, 20, I, was, I was 21 when I got my GED. Congrats, okay. guys. For yeah. You. yeah, not dropouts That's anymore. Yeah, early. yeah, yeah. I dropped out senior year. So yeah, we're don't. in high company here. Are yeah. you a dropout too? No, 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 oh. no. He's I got an Oscar. I don't I, know. I, uh, yeah, I finished and then I dropped out. <laughs> All right, I have uh, I have a real high school diploma, so we're uh, we're the yeah, three yeah, educated guys. You were also uh, you won the tenth best drummer of all time in uh, Rolling Stone. Does that mean anything to you? Once, uh, when you well, it's a, I was demoted. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, I didn't that sucks. That. Okay, Sorry, years, where were you years ago I was five. Oh, and now I'm ten. And the weird I'm thing not is, even in the top you know, one hundred. Could, could you say ten out of a, a thousand? Or oh, yeah, yeah, top ten. I figured that's you know, how ten, you got it. Tenth out of ten just somehow doesn't have a ring to it. Oh um, yeah, because the list is top ten. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. So you just made See, it. I just squeaked in there. <laughs> <laughs> Who's right ahead of you? Do you know? Who, I who? don't know. Number nine. But, but the thing is that Buddy Rich isn't even on that list, so the whole thing is kind of meaningless. Who's number one? Who's considered? Is, is it uh, either Bono, Ginger Baker? It's, 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 I think it's no, Bono. no, 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 no. It's either these things go around. It's either Neil Pert, who's a good buddy of mine. Yeah. Um, although I've been trying to chop him down for years. Yeah. Uh, but he's up. He's, it's usually Neil, and uh, or Ringo or John Bonham. Ringo. Here you yeah. go, Neil Peart. Ah, Top 100 Pert. greatest drummers of all time. Yeah, how does go. how is how is that not Ginger Baker though? I mean, even though he was crazy, he, he, was... Do, he doesn't make it for some reason. He was one of my. I would have had him in the top 10. He's easy. not on the list at all. Yeah. Oh, jeez. Well, he's, little... some, he's there somewhere. Oh, but he's not in the top. He's 10. not in the top 10. He I'm be. not in the top 100 list even of guitar players in Rolling Stone. I've never made a list anywhere in my and life. Rolling does Stone doesn't know I true. even exist. Does it bother they you? Never have. Does it bother you? Honestly, yeah, I hate those fuckers. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a fan. <laughs> Good either. for you. Well, you know they're a little pandering. They're kind Fuck of. Um, them. They're, I remember the Playboy magazine used to have uh, an annual. Music, you know, the top guitarist, top singer, sure. Mm -hmm. And the top sitar player one year was George Harrison. Oh, <laughs> come on. That gives you an idea of the validity validity of these um, yeah. lists. But it does feel nice to be mentioned. Like you know, it's funny. Like we always say about critics, ah, they don't know what they're talking about. But nobody's ever read a positive review and said critics don't know what they're talking about. I'm guilty of it too. No, they but do boy. know what they're talking about. These are guys. You know, musicians would hate to own up to this. Uh, and I've had arguments with fellow musicians about this. No, those guys do know what they're talking about. They have an opinion which might not be the same as yours, but they listen to music every day much more closely than you do, you skinny musician. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I, I re read all of you, good, bad, and the ugly, and I've learned from bad reviews, I've learned from good reviews, Yeah. Um, because in, as an artist, you're surrounded by people who tell you how great you are. Yes, people, yeah. Yes, people. In, in uh, a review, whether it's hostile, even if the guy's a scumbag, you learn something that nobody around you would have said. What has hurt you in a review? Has anything you've read went like only like, if it's true? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. And sometimes it is. Have you it read stings. something that was true that well, that made you like, oh God, they saw yeah, that? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The um, <laughs> my first orchestral piece, which was a ballet for the San Francisco Ballet, um, I learned the expression "shoddy farrago." Mm -hmm. I had to look up "jejun noodling." What's that mean? Uh, I'll have to look it up again. <laughs> but it wasn't good. But that review <laughs> was negative. a keeper. And, it, and by the way, it did suck. It was my first orchestral piece, and it wasn't great. But there was four bars of it that kicked ass. Well, it kicked my ass, okay? And that was what, you know, that was good. Enough. That I got to write more. I got to write more. But that review... Uh, was such a scorched earth review that I that that was a keeper that one I've got that one framed nice you guys right both, next to my Grammys you both seem pretty <laughs> grounded though like again and again that's the, the the advantage of being long term musicians and you're working together you you both seem like you've seen every aspect of the business you both had tremendous successes you both won a lot of shit so you both kind of it's it's like all right this stuff that might throw a younger person or a newer musician 
uh, isn't going to throw you off. You guys will probably work well together. Does that make any sense? Probably not. <laughs> well, I still hate it when reviewers try to try to convince people that I'm losing my hair. I, I really. Why would they say that? Why would they say that? You're yeah. getting yeah, rid of it on understand purpose. That. It's not I just losing. Don't understand that. What, I, are, what are they? What picture are they looking yeah, at? That's a great yeah. soul patch. I, I see. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I've worked on it for years. <laughs> it's a beauty. It's in honor of Frank Zappa, by the way. Uh, is, right? is it really? Course, yes. That's all I can think of this whole interview is that you're on that album. It makes me crazy. I fucking love that record so much it, it makes me sick how much i love that record which record Great. shake your booty shake oh, yeah. your booty my favorite zappa was 200 motels i don't know that one I i'm not a huge zappa fan i'm like that album is one of my favorite you things know, in history booty is out of all his 55 or 60 records the number one seller is it really? Yeah. The top oh, seller. fucking Jewish princess dancing full. It's such an amazing, great record. Well, great I'm happy record. to meet you. Um, you they get the word poop shoot even in that record. Yeah, ram it a, too. The, that's a lovely term. What is the grape, by the way? The uh, grape was a. I, I was told this by, I believe, Patrick O'Hearn, the bass player. It was a transvestite bar. Oh, I I thought it was a gay. Okay, yeah, yeah. It was, it's a reference to one of the Zappa songs. Yeah. Then I just I just all I want to do is sit for two hours there. and talk about that song. Okay. Yeah. Okay, well, yeah. next time you have me on the show, we'll yes. talk. Yes, we'll talk about the grape and Zappa. Yeah. Okay. 